All right, good morning, everyone. We're here for 9.45 a.m. hearing, Committee on Energy and Environmental Protection. Uh, it is Tuesday, February 15th. We are in conference room 325. And uh, first up on our agenda this morning, we have House Bill 1501 relating to the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. This establishes the research partnership program within the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute that allows businesses or private entities to partner with or utilize research conducted by the Institute for the purposes of expansion under certain conditions. And first up to testify, we have uh, Rick from HNEI. Thank you, Chair Lowen, Vice Chair Martin, members of the committee. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm Rick Rochlow, Director of the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute. Uh, HNEI certainly supports uh, anything that enables us to establish research partnerships with industry, both locally and, and nationally, and, and we also partner internationally. However, we believe that this bill may be unnecessary as there already are many well-defined pathways within the university for establishing such partnerships, and we do so already. However, if the committee would like this to be part of the legislation, we have offered some possible suggestions that we hope the uh, committee would consider in, in modifying the language. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and I will be uh, remain on for questions. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we don't have anyone else that submitted testimony or signed up to testify in person. So members, are there any questions? All right, if not, we'll move on to the next bill on our agenda, House Bill 1937 relating to the Hawaii Hydrogen Strategic Plan. This requires HNEI to conduct a study to examine the state's ability to advance hydrogen production from local renewable energy resources and develop the Hawaii Hydrogen Strategic Plan utilizing the results of its study, which shall be reviewed and updated every four years. First up to testify, we have uh, Department of Budget and Finance with comments. Uh, and then Rick Rochelo, HNEI. Go ahead, Rick. Okay, um, Chair, Vice Chair, thank you again. Um, we, we do support this bill. We have offered a number of comments in regard to the language and, and the, the main uh, subject of that additional language is that the hydrogen plan is not developed absent uh, consideration of all the other activities and planning that's going on that is looked at is how does it fit into the overall energy planning and not be a standalone uh, energy study uh, just for hydrogen. Um, we've offered those comments and again I'll be happy to address any questions that would arise. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you and next up we have uh, Scott Glenn, Hawaii State Energy Office. Morning, Chair Lowen, uh, Vice Chair Martin, members of the committee. We stand on our testimony and I'd just like to echo the comments that Director Rochello made. Thank you. And then we have um, test, written testimony from the Hawaii, Hawaii Bioeconomy Trade Organization in support. And then Life of the Land, Henry Curtis. Are you here, Henry, uh, with comments? Uh, we have written testimony from Servco Pacific in support. Um, written testimony from HCAT in support. Written testimony from Ulupono Initiative in support. And we have Alliance for Automotive uh, Innovation. Tiffany Yajima, are you present? With testimony in support, we have Hawaii Gas, Julie Yunker. Go ahead, Julie. Hey, good morning, Chair, Vice Chair, members of the committee, Julie Yunker with Hawaii Gas. Hawaii Gas supports HB 1937 relating to the Hawaii Hydrogen Strategic Plan. We asked the committee to consider amending the language slightly to include gas utilities and the stakeholders named in section three as follows. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. And then we have testimony from a couple more individuals with comments. Is there anyone else I missed who signed up to testify in person? All right, if not members, any questions? Um, all right, I'll ask a few questions um, for Rick or Scott. Um, this, I guess, first of all, I'm interested in kind of clarifying the roles of HNEI versus HSEO. So 
uh, which do you see as the entity that does sort of energy planning? Scott, I'll defer to you to go first on this one. Okay, thanks, Rick. Uh, I saw you were un unmuted, so I was waiting for you. Um, uh, Chair, thank you. It's a good question. Um, HNEI and HSEO are um, sister energy agencies. I think one thing that's uh, an important distinction is HNEI is part of the University of Hawaii, which is meant to have a autonomy under its research uh, interests. Um, HSCO is an executive branch agency, and I serve as an appointee of the governor. So uh, I have a direct uh, policy role in terms of working with the governor and reflecting and advising the governor on energy policy matters. Um, statutorily, uh, I believe HNEI and HSCO are connected. So we serve as an advisor to HNEI on their use of the barrel tax funds. And we also work closely with HNEI on the different projects we work on. Um, Rick, maybe you might agree or disagree with this, but I would say that um, HNEI has a very um, technical expertise role that they can bring to analyzing energy questions. And the Energy Office, I think, has more of a policymaking view. Um, not that, you know, I in, in, any, in any way mean to uh, supplant the legislature's role in policymaking, but in terms of translating it to executive branch action, that um, we play more of that role as well as coordinating with the other energy entities um, in state government. Rick, does that sound accurate to you or you're welcome to uh, opine or correct or? No, I, I think that's a, a good summary. We do tend to be more on the technical side and, and looking for the, in this specific case, it would be what the role hydrogen could play and the implication of it relative to all the other energy options we have. But when it does come to policy and then some of the implication activities beyond that, uh, certainly we would look to the state energy office, whether we lead or they lead. I think there are definitely roles for both organizations within this study. Uh, I will definitely go with that as a, a closing summary. Um, then second question, the, the particular focus on studying hydrogen, and I think you kind of alluded to this, Rick, like it doesn't maybe not make a lot of sense to study it in a, a vacuum of just looking at the one energy resource. And have we ever conducted studies of other specific resources like this? Like have we done a, a study for the Hawaii plan for solar or wind or um, like any other specific resource? There, there there probably have been narrow studies, but I can't, the, the only one I can really think of in, in, in there are similar bills now to look at some of the uh, aviation fuels and sustainable aviation issues. And I guess I would make the same comment to that, that I think, I think that's a very important study, but I think it's a piece of an overall study, you know, the, whether it's sustainable aviation or ground transportation or the power system, these all need to be looked at in integrated fashion. So the studies can have an independent analysis and component to them, but, but yeah, I really believe they need to be fully integrated in or you won't really be able to determine the net value to the system of, of these other com, you know, competing and, and contributing technologies. Yeah, and if you're looking at a certain energy resource, but you're sort of not comparing its costs and benefits to other energy resources alongside it, you're missing such a big part of the picture to not look at everything together, right? Because hydrogen could have some benefits in certain use cases and then uh, not be suitable for others. Yes, and I mean, hydrogen can do a lot of different things, but finding where the value is and which use cases make sense, I think is very important. And that can't be done in a vacuum, I agree entirely. Thank you. And then a last question for both of you. I think if we move this forward, We'd like to clarify that what we're interested in exploring in the state of Hawaii is like green hydrogen or renewable hydrogen. And in looking into this, I think we would, I would, and what I'm thinking of doing is using the term renewable hydrogen and then defining that as um, hydrogen produced entirely from renewable sources that have life cycle emissions of no more than 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. And this matches up to um, a definition that's used in the EU. Does that sound appropriate? I, I, I'll say something and then let Scott contribute. I, I, I fully agree that we should be looking only at renewable hydrogen. I worry a little bit about putting the greenhouse gas limit on it 
because depending, even if it's renewable and even if it's substantially beneficial relative to fossil, depending how you're doing that accounting of the greenhouse gas, that may be a limit uh, that restricts some of the options that might be available to us. I'm not saying it does for sure. So I agree with the renewable. I think we need to be a little careful about putting a hard number on the greenhouse gas emissions because it really depends how you're doing that whole life cycle analysis where you're gonna come out on that number. Well, isn't the idea to lower emissions? It is, and, and I think that I think lower emissions and, and renewable is an absolutely important component of it. I just think putting a specific number value on how high that can be might be detrimental or limiting to some of the options that may well lower emissions, but not necessarily meet that specific number. Uh, how about you, Scott? Um, thanks, uh, Chair. The the tying it to a greenhouse gas um, threshold seems to be an emerging practice. You referenced the EU um, without having conferred with Rick on this. Um, you know, we just, I just returned from DC where we were uh, hearing presentations from the US Department of Energy. You know, they are looking at um, $10 billion in the IIJA for clean renewable hydrogen. And, um, I think they're still trying to figure out how they're going to define that. One of the things though that they said was they're looking to move away from the quote unquote colors of hydrogen and focusing more on carbon intensity as a, as a factor for considering it. Uh, but I, I don't recall at the time them giving a, an explicit number, but they did say that that seemed to be a more useful metric from their thinking in terms of rather than green or pink or blue or all the different colors of hydrogen out there. Yeah, and I think the EU's definition, I mean, the part that we left, that I left out of that statement that's also included in the EU's definition is that it specifies not biomass. But I think that you're right, Rick, it would eliminate some options of hydrogen made from uh, fuels that are renewable, but maybe not low carbon. But I would argue that's not necessarily a bad thing. I mean, I don't think those would be the most cost effective anyway. We need to clarify what we're, what we're driving at here. Well, and, and I guess it would, even, even depending on some of the studies you look at, if you use solar and if, for example, if you had solar with some stores to level out the solar and then utilize that to make hydrogen, uh, probably the predominance of the literature would put that at above that 50 gram per kilowatt hour threshold. So again, it, it, it gets into the nitty gritty of, of who's doing that analysis and how, and I was just trying not to limit it. I do think greenhouse gas emissions and the carbon intensity should be a critical criteria. I was just a little hesitant to try to put a specific number that only a below a certain level would be considered. Right, well, this number is, I mean, has been used in the, or proposed to be used in the EU, so it's not out of nowhere. Like I would assume they've analyzed what is the emissions per kilowatt hour of, you know, things like wind and solar and that it would fall below that. Um, okay, thanks. I see Brett Perusa, you have a question, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so my concern, and I think it's echoed in some of the testimony on this measure, um, is that, and, and you're alluding to it, I, I think, um, is that the local renewable energy sources that would be used to make a hydrogen um, might include biomass. And um, I think that that's a particularly dangerous route to uh, follow. Um, and I'm wondering if we could... Um, say, except biomass. <laughs> if, if biomass is included in our definitions of renewable um, and we consider it to be problematic, can we simply exclude it in the language of this bill? Um, is this a question is that for, for... That's actually a question for, I mean, actually- for, maybe for Who Scott. is this a question for? It's, it's this is a me. question for Scott, <laughs> what he thinks about that. Uh, thank you, Rep. Russo. Um, I would, I would just caution that for biomass, um, there are a lot of things that count as biomass and including green waste. And right now our practice is just to compost or throw away green waste and let it rot and could un maybe unintentionally or intentionally preclude that as a consideration. Mm, okay. Um, I'm more interested in diverting organic waste uh, to composting, but I see your point. Okay. Uh, well, if I, if I, 
replace hundreds of thousands of acres of invasive trees and vegetation with natives. And if we were to pursue that in the earnest way that we would like to, we'll be creating tons of green waste by mm. removing invasive species and they would just be rotting. Any further questions, members? Rep Martin. This is a question for, I guess, Rick and Scott. Do you think that resolving this question could be part of the study? How could it be written into the studies as part of that to, to consider what is truly beneficial and low carbon intensity? Uh, Rick, I happily defer to you. I would say that could be something that's aimed at is establishing what kind of threshold might be, you know, how do we, part of the question would be, how do we get there as well, I think. Rick? I, I think first, I think an, an outcome of a study, in addition to what is the, the potential cost value or reliability value to the grid or to the transportation system, would be an assessment of what is the carbon intensity of those selections so that then policy could be appropriately derived. It may well be there could be cost benefits and technical benefits, but if the if the if the carbon benefits are not in line with those from a policy perspective, uh, the study should identify that. So yes, I the short answer is yes, I agree fully that that's something that the study should consider and, and include as part of the out, outcomes. All right, any further questions, members? Great, if not, we will move on. Um, next on the agenda, we have House Bill 1682. This is um, a special purpose revenue bond for Next Level Solutions Group, Inc. And we have testimony with comments from Department of Budget and Finance, and then testimony from uh, Tony Hong in support. Tony, are you present? All right, if not, is there anyone else here to testify on this measure? If not, members, any questions? All right, if not, we'll move on to House Bill 2203. Uh, this is another special purpose revenue bond to assist Dibs Hawaii LLC. Uh, we have comments from Department of Budget and Finance. We have testimony from Hawaii State Energy Office in support. We have Department of Hawaiian Homelands in support, and Keone Ford from Dibs Hawaii. Testimony in support. Are you present? Go ahead, Keone. Aloha, Kako. Um, Chair, Representative Loan, Vice Chair Martin, committee members, mahalo for the opportunity to um, show support. Dibs Hawaii support of House Bill 2203. Um, we feel that it has incredible merit in being able to adjust a lot of the discussions today around carbon dioxide and carbon recovery has incredible implications to support agriculture, um, cold chain logistics, and really creating a platform to mitigate our carbon emissions and actually start to put focus on our ability to demonstrate our ability to recover carbon and utilize it and place it in the most vulnerable communities to grow food, fuel, and um, further the state's um, goals towards climate change. So mahalo nui and have a wonderful day. Aloha. Thank you. And then we also have testimony and support from Ohanahui Ventures and then five additional individuals in support, two in opposition and one with comments. Is there anyone else here to testify on this? If not, members, any questions? Uh, Rep. Martin, go ahead. Um, this is a question for Kioni. Kioni, can you talk about some of the uses that that the the product that you you get from this um, from processing the emissions? What the uses that would be put to, and and what the supply is like now for that product in Hawaii? The availability. Absolutely. Thank you for the opportunity to um, further discuss uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, Representative Martin, I 
I, um, my, our view on CO2 is one of crisis. Um, and being a dry ice blasting company where we use CO2 to clean the most critical applications where water, sand, chemicals are not available to go in and clean. And these are a lot of the modern systems that we'd like to put into place. And so our applications of dry ice cleaning is, is in full force to mitigate our carbon offset. So I wanna say that dry ice is a very important piece to, um, to Hawaii's ability to address cold chain logistics, um, cleaning, prevent, total preventative maintenance for some of these new platforms. So um, on its face, dry ice, um, when sourced at a local, sourced locally, locally um, does support agriculture. So I'm gonna first and foremost talk about dry ice. The liquid carbon dioxide has an incredible um, implication for modern farming, future farming, vertical farming, uh, uh, warehouse farming, where that would be dissolved into irrigation water and there would be CO2 enrichment um, to help promote 30% production um, and efficiency of the plant cellular growth. And it also supports um, pathogen growth and, and pests because it creates an environment um, with oxygen and CO2 where those are can, it, it lowers the presence of that. So we're protecting this goal of nutrient dense food. So I really wanna, then you know, say that we want to see 70% of the CO2 that would be recovered to support our agricultural food chain and the energy that relates to that. Um, and then on the other side, we would have federal contracts. Um, I believe CO2, um, when injected into concrete, creates an incredible platform um, to se sequester carbon dioxide that's visibly present in our infrastructure, in our buildings, I think that's a wonderful platform. Um, they, we have to overcome supply chain issues. If CO2 is not available to everything that I just explained at a large volume when they need it, they, those, those will never happen. So we can't have these, these movements and shifts towards this consciousness if we don't have the basic um, virtual pipeline to support these changes. Right now, our CO2 supports the soda industry. Um, you know, the soft drink industry, and, and it's dedicated to that. And I think that, that this demonstrates our ability as residents, um, as, as an island people, that, that we're resilient, we're robust, and we can recover our own carbon dioxide and really demonstrate and lead the way and show the rest of the world that Hawaii um, knows how to address climate change. Mahalo. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Any further questions, members? All right. If not, uh, we have next on our agenda, House Bill 2042, uh, relating to solar energy. This permits counties to um, enact ordinances for solar easements. And uh, first up, we have testimony from uh, Scott Glenn, Hawaii State Energy Office, with comments. Good morning, Chair. Uh, we submitted comments. We have not had the opportunity to really analyze the potential um, effects of the bill. But we wanted to at least provide some information to the committee that other jurisdictions have been adopting ordinances and statutes along these lines. And so um, we at least wanted to make that available for you and um, it's attached in the testimony. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have um, testimony from Gerard Silva in opposition. That is all the testimony we have submitted. Members, any questions? I've got one question, Chair. Go ahead. Uh, this is for Scott Gladden. Uh, the concept of an energy of a solar easement, I can understand, but in the second part of the bill, uh, county authority requiring trimming of vegetation blocking solar energy, it, it doesn't seem like the, uh, it doesn't seem like any easements are involved in that at all. It seems like uh, one estate, two unrelated estates, one can just kind of make the other one cut its trees shorter. Is that is that your read of this bill as well? And, and I'm wondering if any other states that you know of have something similar. Uh, thank you, Rep. I, I, I don't have a clear answer for that. I, as I said, we're still looking at what the potentials of this bill would be. And so we would have to come back with you um, afterward and try to follow up with you on, on a response to this. Okay, but you, you, you haven't heard of any other states doing something similar to that portion as of uh, right now? I'm not sure. I, okay. No example comes to mind right now. Yep. Thank you. Thanks, you. Thank you, Chair. 
Sure, any other questions, members? All right, if not last on our agenda, we have House Bill 1992 relating to the environment. This permits composting and co-composting um, as an allowable use of ag lands and appropriates funds to restore an environmental health specialist position to the solid and hazardous waste branch of Department of Health. And first up, we have uh, comments from Department of Budget and Finance, and then we have Department of Health. Anyone present from Department of Health? Yes, good morning, Chair Lowen, Vice Chair Martin, and members of the committee. Department of Health stands on its written testimony providing comments on this bill, and we'd like to thank Vice Chair Martin for recognizing our limited resources and um, supporting restoration of our position to our office. We're available for any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And then Department of Agriculture with comments. Mm -hmm. Good morning, Representative Lowen. Uh, Department of Agriculture will rest on its testimony expressing its concerns. I do have staff uh, standing by to answer some of the questions that I, I'm aware that you have. And uh, so at the appropriate time, if we could bring them forward. Thank you for um, you know, uh, uh, bringing this important matter forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, then we have Office of Planning and Sustainable Development. And support. Uh, there's a number of people signed up from Department of Agriculture. I'm assuming everyone's gonna be here for questions, but I don't need to call them individually. Then we yes. have White. Oh, did I miss someone? Okay. Oh, oh. Okay, great. Thank you. <laughs> and then we have Hawaii County Department of Environmental Management in support. Uh, County of Maui Department of Environmental Management. Tamara, go ahead. Aloha. My kako, mahalo so much for the opportunity to testify. Uh, thank you for uh, the invitation. Um, so we are testifying in strong support. This is a major uh, issue for the County of Maui because we have been unable to um, add a, find a, a sufficiently uh, zoned uh, area for our, uh, to site a new composting facility. This bill would allow for us to use uh, land that is adjacent to our landfill, um, which is zoned as agricultural land, to site a new composting facility. If we can uh, shift the zoning, we would not need to rezone it. Currently, Land Use Commission has indicated that they will not provide uh, additional special use permits. We have been doing this activity, or we had been doing this activity for over 25 years a co-composting facility uh, through a special use permit, but we're, our understanding is that the Land Use Commission will is going to shift that. So this would really help us to move forward with siting and permitting a new facility. This is co co composting and co-composting is a highly regulated activity. Changing the zoning would not change any of the Department of Health regulations. Um, all it would do is would be allow us to do uh, uh, conduct that activity on the ag land, but we would certainly, of course, move forward with uh, all Department of Health regulations. Um, I just want to point out that uh, activities such as wind generated activity, biofuel production, solar energy facilities, geothermal resources exploration and development as well as others are all currently allowable activities. Um, composting is an agricultural product and it is our position that it should also be an allowable activity on agricultural land. Uh, so because it's a highly regulated activity, we absolutely support additional staff for the Department of Health, which will provide increased oversight um, of small scale as well as municipal scale composting programs. So we respectfully urge this committee to pass this bill. Um, and again, mahalo nui for the opportunity to testify in support. Mahalo. Thank you. And next we have uh, Climate Protectors, Hawaii in support, 350 Hawaii in support, Hawaii Farm Bureau in support, Hawaii Alliance for Progressive Action in support, the North Shore EVP in support, uh, two individuals with written testimony and support. And then we also have Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii who signed up to testify um, in person in support. Is Rafael here? Yeah. Aloha, Chair Lowen, Vice Chair Martin. 
Uh, mahalo for the opportunity to testify. My name is Rafael Bergstrom. I'm the Executive Director for Sustainable Coastlines Hawaii. And we are definitely in support of this. And just in general, the idea of expanding compost across the state, it's uh, one of our best opportunities going forward in the future to mitigate climate change uh, and reduce CO2 in our atmosphere. We have so many degraded soils across our state and the opportunity to take something like food waste, which is a resource and should not be being burned um, or landfilled and actually being creating nutrient rich soil amendments that we're not importing from elsewhere. And, and ultimately right now, there's not really any composting going on in our state at a level that is effective to actually create this nutrient rich soil amendment and anything that we can do to start breaking down the barriers to move forward with this, we're really going to be helping our, our state, not only for CO2 emissions, but also for the ability to grow food locally here in Hawaii and import less from elsewhere. I know that Department of Health struggles right now with having the capacity to be able to go through all the permits that could be coming at them. And I love the idea of giving them more capacity too. So mahalo for putting this bill in and I really appreciate it, everybody who's in support of this. Thank you. Great, thank you. That is all the testifiers we have. So um, we'll move to questions. I'm gonna actually start if that's okay. Um, for Department of Agriculture and Department of Health, I think the question that came up in testimony was what kind of regulation there is about uh, ensuring that in composting facilities <laughs> that, that they're not um, facilitating the spread of invasive species. And it seems like, I mean, this is an issue probably, I'm, get, well, I'm curious what kind of, to what degree this is already an issue with existing composting facilities, even if they're not on you know, they're not on ag land because it's not an allowable use of ag land, but I imagine existing composting facilities, I mean, is there any strict regulation about practices to ensure that they are not um, spreading invasive species? Oh, for, for Department of Health, I, I'd like to call forward um, um, Dr. Helmut Rog and um, Darcy o Oishi. And, um, to provide some answers for you. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. Darcy, go ahead, sorry. Um, uh, good afternoon, good morning. My name is Darcy Oishi. Thank you, Rep Martin uh, and the committee for, um, sorry, Rep Chair Lowen, Rep Martin and, and the committee. Uh, thank you for asking this question. Um, <clears throat> currently, the Department of Health's existing permitting practices uh, required for uh, uh, green waste recyclers is adequate for addressing uh, most invasive species issues. Um, what the Department is of Agriculture is encountering is issues that um, uh, the movement of green waste uh, uh, can move invasive species. Um, and uh, especially if that waste is not processed in a timely fashion uh, where the temperatures get elevated and um, uh, the piles are not turned in a timely fashion, which the Department of Health process is uh, addresses all of these concerns uh, through their permitting. Uh, we have also provided Department of Health with uh, facts and background information for best practices to address uh, issues like coconut rhinoceros beetle and little fire ant uh, and other issues, which um, are uh, are excellent at addressing these uh, invasive species issues, but we do have concerns, um, and the department is looking at uh, temporary uh, interim and long term solutions to addressing green waste as a vector for invasive species issues. Also, so like, but. So the currently, I guess, and for Department of Health, I mean, there's no, there's sort of recommended best practices, but there's not any kind of like enforcement or where do the issues arise? I mean, we're having this discussion because there's a bill related to expanding where we can site composting facilities, but I imagine this problem already exists with our currently cited composting facilities. So what's the possible, what kind of a solution do you propose? So on behalf of the Department of Health, we do permit certain composting operations. 
And um, I would say I would constitute them being maybe majority of the large composting operations. There are a few exemptions that our rules already allow for. Um, so for those facilities in the application process, we do share the Department of Ag's recommendations for invasive species management, but um, and we work with the facilities to see if they can and, um, address those concerns as part of their application. However, if we encounter facilities who are resistant or if through our inspections, we see concerns with regards to the specific invasive species issues that we cannot enforce, we would certainly defer that to the Department of Agriculture for follow-up. Um, so we can work with the Department of Ag for our permitted facilities. Uh, for the, the mentioning of the hauling of material or uh, uh, exempt operations or facilities that do not accept waste, we do not have that ability to assist. So like, and I guess this is for Department of Ag, if there was a composting facility that was uh, not following best practices and was uh, spreading invasive species and you could document this in some way, like, is there any ability in statute to enforce or is that not, that's not a violation of the law in any way? To, to would, sort of fail to, fail to follow best practices and, and to spread invasive species. I mean, would it help if you had a mechanism to enforce? But the answer there is a little bit more complex, Representative Lowen it would really depend upon the target species. So um, <clears throat> for instance, the coconut rhinoceros beetle and the little fire ant are both listed within uh, Hawaii Administrative Rules 4-69A, uh, which does allow us to, grants us the ability to take actions. Um, but some of uh, um, there are potentially other invasive species that would not be listed uh, which would which would not give us the statutory authority ne needed to take actions. But if there was even at least uh, something that covered the ones that are listed, it would be better than what you have now, which is nothing. Correct. Okay. Um, Rep. Martin, do you have questions? No. The, like any further, anyone, any further comments, I guess, either from, from Department of Ag? Um, Chair yeah, Lowen, Chair Lowen, um, um, Vice Chair Martin, members of the committee, I'm Helma Drog, I'm the Administrator of the Plant Industry Division of the Department of Ag. Um, thank you for bringing that topic up. Um, invasive species and composting green waste are related. There are There is a pathway and we are very appreciative of the work um, that you're doing and also our Department of Health. We've been working with the Department of, um, of Health with that issue for many years. And um, we are currently working with our coconut rhinoceros beetle where we have proof that compost is moving um, coconut rhinoceros beetle around the island here, Oahu. Um, we are trying to address that right now with an interim rule of regulating the, the spread of that using um, our authority to, to regulate green waste and um, composting. And I think part of that bill also addresses um, or, or is, is looking at operations that are not licensed or permitted by the Department of Health, like schools, um, where it is on a small scale. That's something where we certainly um, want to emphasize that if you produce as you're not on a permit, the compost needs to stay on the site. It can it should not be moved because that's then where the risk increases of moving um, invasive species. And we are working right now with industry on compliance agreements um, based on our interim rule, so we can work with our industry and um, um, green waste. Um, operators, how to make that, mitigate all the risk um, by operating with green waste. So thank you again for your, for your um, attention to this detail. Okay, all right, members, any further questions? All right, if not, we will recess for decision-making.
All right, we are back for decision making. Uh, first up, uh, HB 1501, the only testimony we got on this bill said it was not necessary, so we're gonna defer this. Um, House Bill 1937, why the hydrogen strategic plan and making a number of changes to this. Um, uh, first, we're going to change all references to hydrogen to renewable hydrogen. And then we're gonna define renewable hydrogen um, as hydrogen produced from renewable sources with life cycle emissions, no more than 50 grams of CO2 per kilowatt hour. It sounds like that might, could be discussed further, but I think that's a good starting point. Um, we are going to make some changes to the scope of the study in um, section one to reduce redundancy and, and clarify the scope. We're adding a few things to it, including looking at safety and storage um, and uh, just clarifying a number of things in that section. We're going to um, re remove the requirement to do a strategic plan following the study every four years and instead clarify that, um, you know, because planning around hydrogen shouldn't be done independent of planning around other energy resources and independent of the whole big picture. So we're going to um, specify that the results of the study should be used to inform um, energy planning, decarbonization efforts and other ongoing work being undertaken by the Hawaii State Energy Office uh, in collaboration with HNEI. And then we'll remove the appropriation section because HNEI indicated they can use funds from their barrel tax allocation that they already have a ceiling to spend um, and we will add um, gas utilities to the stakeholder list for the um, testimony of white gas. And then we will defect the date to July 1st, 2100 and move this forward. So members, any discussion? All right, if not, Vice Chair, please take the vote. Excuse me. Voting on HB 1937, Chair recommends passing with amendments. Chair, Vice Chair, vote aye. Representative Hashem. Representative Matayoshi. Aye. Representative Peruso. Aye. Representative Todd. Aye. Representative Tokioka. Aye. Representative Matsumoto. Aye. Chair, your um, recommendation is adopted. Thank you. For House Bill 1682. Um, issuance of special purpose revenue bonds to assist Next Level Solutions, Inc. We're going to blank out the amounts, defect the date to July 1st, 2100, and move this forward. Members, any discussion? If not, Vice Chair, please take the vote. Voting on HB 1682. Chair recommends passing with amendments. Seeing all members are present, are there any no's or um, reservations? Hearing none, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thank you. And House Bill 2203, this is issuance of special purpose revenue bonds to assist Dibs Hawaii LLC. We're going to blank out the amounts, affect the date to July 1st, 2100 and move this forward. Uh, members, any discussion? If not, uh, Vice Chair, please take the vote. Um, voting on HB 2203, Chair recommends passing with amendments. Seeing all members are present, are there any no's or reservations? Hearing none, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. And House Bill 2042, uh, relating to solar energy on this, we're gonna defect the date and move it forward for further discussion. Members, any discussion? If not, Vice Chair, please take the vote. I'm voting on HB 2042. Chair recommends passing with amendments. Seeing all are present, are there any no's or reservations? Reservations. Um, sorry, that was... Uh, Representative Tokyoka. Yes, thank you. Are there uh, any reservations? Uh, Representative Matayoshi. Any other no's or reservations? Hearing none, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Thanks. And then last on the list, we have House Bill 1992. Um, this is allowing composting and co composting facilities on ag lands. We're going to uh, adopt Department of Health suggested amendments surrounding um, the language they prefer for authorizing the position. Um, and the date on that is already defective. So we will um, move that forward. Uh, and that's all, members, any discussion? All right, if not, Vice Chair, please take the vote. 
voting on House Bill 1992 HD1. Um, chair recommends passing with amendments. Seeing all members are present, are there any no's or reservations? Hearing none, Chair, your recommendation is adopted. Great, thank you, and we are adjourned.